Yeah, let's continue with our class. Uh, we stopped around John 12, 34, 35. Um, now if we can maybe read John 12, verse 37 onwards. Um, John 12, 37 to maybe 43. Yeah, I think that would be good. So yeah, if we can now read from John 12, 37 to 43, please. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their heart and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even among the rulers many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Okay, there's some important points being made over here. Um, it says that there's a reason why these people refuse to believe in Jesus. Um, it says uh, they still, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. This particular quotation uh, it's taken from isaiah chapter 53 verse 1 you know in our uh, christian circles isaiah 53 is a very popular chapter we are very familiar with it we are very familiar with the with the deeds which the messiah does in the, you know in this particular chapter so um, in isaiah 52 it talks about how you know the deliverer of the Lord will come, how he will redeem his people, uh, all that is talked about in Isaiah 52, where it talks about how a day will come when the people will be saved, there will be redemption, there will be victory. So all these beautiful and grand things are talked about in Isaiah 52. And then when you enter into Isaiah 53, it begins with these words, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So Isaiah recognizes the fact that even though he is prophesying about the beautiful, grand victory which God is going to be winning for his people, not many of them are going to believe this wonderful message. Why? Because in Isaiah 53, the deliverer, the Messiah, presents himself in a very different way from the way they had expected him to look. You know, so... In Isaiah 53, you're talking about a, a, a you know a, a servant savior, one who is a man of sorrows, one who undergoes a punishing and beating for us. So this is not the kind of glorious, victorious redeem, uh, redeemer whom they had perceived in their minds. So in Isaiah 52. After talking about how the Lord will come and how he will redeem Jerusalem and how the power of the Lord will be revealed after talking about all of those things, even as Isaiah is entering into the next chapter, Isaiah 53 verse 1, he says, Lord, very few people are actually going to believe this. Why? Because this Messiah is going to present himself in a very different manner from the one which the people would, would expect. And so, uh, you know, here, Jesus is picking up those words and he's saying, uh, you know, th this is how the people would uh, treat. So, uh, or rather, John, sorry, John the writer is picking up these verses and he says, this is the way the people responded because they were not willing to believe. And he goes on to say, John the writer says in verse 39, for this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts. Now, that is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6, uh, where, you know, um, uh, the Isaiah has a vision of the Lord. He sees the Lord in all of his majesty seated on the throne. And then 
um, the Lord says, who will go for us? And at that time, Isaiah says, you know, I'm willing to go. You know, so um, at that time, the Lord says, I'm going to send you out with a message. But the thing is, the people's hearts are going to be hard. And even though you preach this message, the people will not be willing to hear. Okay, so uh, here in verse 41, uh, John the writer, he writes and he says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Isaiah with his own eyes, he saw Yahweh seated on the throne in all of his glory. His robe filled the temple. You know, the, the train of his robe filled the temple. So when he looked at Yahweh seated over there, he didn't just see God the Father. He saw the Trinitarian God. He saw God the Father, he saw Jesus Christ the Son, and he saw the Holy Spirit. He saw the Trinitarian God seated on the throne, and the train of his robe was filling the temple. So when Isaiah saw this, you know, he saw the glory of Jesus. And that is what he tried to talk about in Isaiah 53, about this glorious Jesus. But he also admitted that the people would not be able to believe because you know they, they were not having hearts that are willing to respond. And so God would have hardened their hearts. So that should not be the fate of us believers today, the ones who know who have trustingly come to Jesus and taken our protection under his shepherdhood. We should not be ha we should not be having blind eyes and hardened hearts. So when we read about the victory, you know, in Colossians chapter 2, about how he has triumphed over the principalities and powers, when we read about how all the allegations against us have been cancelled out, and now Satan no longer has got any hold over us, when we read these things, let our eyes not be blinded. Let our hearts not be hardened to believe this truth and, and gladly, rejoicingly welcome it and accept it. You know, so let... When they heard this message, it had zero effect on them. It just bounced off. It had it didn't help them in any way. But when this message is coming to us today, don't let it bounce off. You know, let us have soft hearts which are willing to receive what is being spoken, and let us recognize the glory of Jesus, what He did, how He glorified Himself on that cross. And let us apply it to our lives and our situations, you know, rather than being blinded, rather than allowing our hearts to become hard, where we cannot receive this beautiful truth. So, um, just to you know, briefly look at Isaiah 52 and 53. In Isaiah 52, 10, this is what it says. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. The Lord Almighty is laying bare his holy arm. Uh, this is imagery from Old Testament times. The arm, the hand, the right hand is supposed to represent the strength of the king, uh, the power and might of the king. So the Lord literally lays bare his arm and says, see how powerful my arm is. See how mighty I am. So with this might and with this power, I am going to bring salvation to the people of the world. So he has laid bare his arm. But then when we come to Isaiah 53, just because it talks about his death, it talks about how he is you know, uh, scourged on our behalf, how he is bearing wounds on our behalf, people assume that he has no power. So Isaiah 53 is not cancelling out what Isaiah 52 told. In Isaiah 52, when it said that he's laying bare his arm and showing his power, that power is demonstrated in Isaiah 53, even when he is going through that experience of the cross. So let us not just be blinded and be like these people of the Old Testament and also the time of Jesus, you know, who refused to believe in what he was saying. And as a result of which their hearts became hardened, let us instead have soft hearts which are willing to believe what is being said and which are gladly willing to accept what is being told so that Jesus can today be glorified in our life situations. Okay, So uh, it is important for us to uh, remember this. And it says that there were many leaders who believed in him. You know, in, in uh, John 12, verse 42, it says that even among the leaders, there were people who believed in him, but 
for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, they refused to acknowledge Jesus. And it explains here that they loved human praise more than praise from God. So they wanted the praise of the chief priest and the top leaders. They wanted the those leaders to praise them and say what wonderful Jews they are. They were not willing to take a risk and acknowledge Jesus and become his followers. And so in response to their behavior, you know, in how they are fearing to come out in the open and acknowledge him, this is what Jesus says in warning. Uh, John 12 um, verses 44 and for, to 46, if you could, if you could read out. John 12, 44 to 46. Jesus shouted to the crowds, If you trust me, you are trusting not only me, but also God who sent me. For when you see me, you are seeing the one who sent me. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world, so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. I will not judge those who hear me, but don't obey me, for I have come to save yeah, the world. We, we will get into those verses a little later, but just to focus on these verses which Jesus speaks out here. He says, if you're trusting me, and it's not just me you're trusting, you're trusting the one who sent me, you know, the Father who is above all. So he says, you are actually putting your trust in someone who is very powerful. So if you refuse to trust in me, then, in fact, you're, ref you're rejecting the Father himself. So that's the warning which Jesus gives to these people who are hesitating to come out in the open and acknowledge Jesus. So how would we apply that in our present-day context? There are people who call themselves secret believers. You know, they don't want to come out in the open and, and let everyone know that they are followers of Jesus. So does this apply to them as well? In the same way, these leaders who were afraid to come out and acknowledge Jesus because, you know, they loved the praise of humans rather than the praise of God. You know, Jesus speaks against them and he says, by refusing to believe in me or in fact rejecting the Father, it's a serious thing that you're doing. So would we go and apply this to secret believers in North Korea, China, you know, in uh, the Muslim countries where there is uh, persecution going on? Not necessarily. Let's look at the next few verses where Jesus carries this thought forward more. Yeah, verse verses 47 to 50, if you can read out. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Here, Jesus is talking about people who believe in his words and keep them. So he says, if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, you know, NIV uses that particular translation to bring out the meaning of what Jesus is saying. He says, if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, For but, you know, the very words I have spoken will condemn them. So here, Jesus is referring to leaders who have heard what Jesus said. They believed what Jesus said, but... They did not want to keep his words and become his followers, obeying him, being submissive to him, being loyal to him. They were not willing to go that step because they did not want to be excommunicated from the synagogue. Here it's not talking about people who genuinely hear and they believe and they start keeping his words. They start practicing it, obeying it, following it. So they are true disciples. They are true followers of Jesus who are not just hearing and believing, but also keeping it in their everyday decision making. Such people are true disciples. And yes, if they are living in times where there is great persecution to save their lives and to save the lives of their family, they may not publicly acknowledge that they are followers of the living God, 
but in their personal actions on a daily basis they are following his words they are obeying him so here we cannot use this particular passage to condemn secret believers it's talking about false uh, followers like these leaders who were not willing to take that final step of not just believing but also practicing and obeying and keeping they were not willing to go that final step secret believers on the other hand are people who are following him they are living in obedience it's just that they have not publicly acknowledged to the you know uh, to the enemy that they are followers because then they would be taken uh, and you know um, put to death so um, here jesus is only talking about those who are not keeping his word not being a true follower not obeying him because he says that such people are in fact rejecting the father himself okay so that's just one clarification so we'll move on from there into uh, john chapter 13 and uh, we'll see how much of it we can cover so john chapter 13 uh, maybe we could start off by looking at the first five verses uh, john 13 Verses one to five. John chapter thirteen. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper began. Ended. The devil, having already put it into the hearts of Judas Iscariot. Simon's son to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands and that He had come from God and was going to God, rose up from supper and laid aside His garments, took a towel, and uh, grinded himself. After that, He poured water into a basin and began to wash disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with the with which He was grinded. all right um verses 3 and 4 um you know in the niv it tries to bring it out in simpler english uh, the reason i generally follow niv is because it uses the english which we are familiar with today you know which we use in our newspapers the the the, the english which is used in our magazines it's the english which we the current generation are familiar with so if possible you know um you, uh, you guys can consult the niv To for to understand the English which is being used in the Bible, uh, because unlike the other religions which read their scriptures in a language which they do not even know, they do it as an empty ritual. We read the Bible to understand what it is saying, so that it, we can fully absorb the meaning of what is being, uh, you know, uh, presented to us in these verses. So we try to go with translations where we fully understand the English which is being, you know, given over there, so that the full impact. of those words you know can impact our lives so here in in, in the niv john 13 verse 3 jesus knew that the father had put all things under his power and that he had come from god and was returning to god so jesus didn't have any doubts about who he is he knew that he is divine he knew that all things had been placed under his power and that he has come with the authority of god having fully understood his high divine status having understood that he gets up and you know uh, takes a towel and begins to wash their feet he didn't do this act because he you know was in some way mistaken about his identity and he he, he thought that he's just another human he knew exactly who he is he knew the authority that he holds and he also understood that if he wants to back out he can back out even at this point see if he doesn't want to go to the cross even now at this point he can choose to back out why because everything has been put under his power so he still has a chance to back out if he wishes to having understood his entire authority he decides i'm going to go ahead and complete what i have come to do because what is doing over here the washing of the feet it's not just a physical act this is spiritual significance and that spiritual uh, significance of what he is doing right now in washing the feet is going to be completed on the cross where he's not only not only going to uh, you know uh, cleanse them physically he's going to cleanse them spiritually so this whole thing which he is doing 
he is now starting off the cleansing process so it's not just a physical act which is being done which is talking about servanthood it's going beyond that it's talking about what he's achieving uh what he's going to achieve on the cross very shortly so having understood his full power he gets up from the meal takes off his robe you know the outer robe and starts to work like a servant um and uh, so we see that being brought out in philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8 uh, if we can read that because there's a direct connection between what is said over here and what is said in philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8 if someone could read out for us philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8 who being in the form of god did not consider it robbery to equal to be equal with god but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of that even that of the cross So here in Philippians chapter two verse six, it very plainly says that when Jesus called himself equal with God, it was not robbing. He was not robbing God of his uh, status. He definitely was equal with God. Jesus fully understood who he was. Having understood who he is, in spite of his ultimate status, he chooses to take the form of a bond servant, take the form of a slave, and come to the earth. to be his father's slave to fulfill all the things which the father wants him to fulfill and his obedience extended to the point of death where he was even willing to die the death of the cross so that is what is being brought out over here in our john chapter 13 passage where jesus fully understanding that all things have been placed under his power knowing that he gets up and starts taking on the role of a slave of a servant and he begins to wash their feet um so this is what happens when he comes to peter uh, um maybe we could read out verses 6 uh, up to verse 11 yeah john 13 verses 6 to 11 please when jesus came to simon peter Peter said to him Lord are you going to wash my feet Jesus replied you don't understand now what i am doing but some day you will no peter prostrated you will never ever wash my feet Jesus replied unless i wash you you won't belong to me Simon Peter exclaimed then wash my hands and head as well Lord not just my feet Jesus replied a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean and you discipline disciplines are clean but not all of you for Jesus knew who would betray him that is what he meant when he said not all of you are clean so we see from these verses that what jesus is doing here is not just a physical act it also has spiritual significance so when G- when jesus takes off his outer robe and starts you know you, the servants don't exactly go around grandly dressed in a outer robe because you know they, they the robe would get uh, dirty and dusty so they basically take off the outer robe when they are doing all their you know uh, work as a uh, servant so now jesus is basically doing that he's taken off his, his nice outer outer robe and he's getting down on his knees and he's beginning to serve them and peter is horrified and peter says you shall never wash my feet um and um uh, yeah um, in verse 6 uh, you know the the greek bring, brings out the meaning of what he's saying very beautifully we kind of don't catch it in our english you know where peter says to him lord are you washing my feet uh, if you look at the greek and you were to literally translate the greek word by word uh, it would literally be lord you of mine wash the feet you know you are washing me my my feet i mean like the contrast between you and me is brought out over there so literally the the greek translation would be lord you of mine wash the feet 
I mean, it's like too shocking. How can someone of your stature choose to wash the feet of someone like me? Because there's a huge gap between who you are and who I am. And then Jesus says, unless I do this, you know, you cannot even have a uh, be, be a part of me. And when Jesus says that, he's like, okay, if, if that is the case, if only if you wash me, I can be a part of you, then go ahead, wash my hands, or, you know, wash my head, wash everything. And then Jesus says, don't worry, you're already clean. So now only your feet need to be washed. What was Jesus talking about over here? In what way were they already clean? Uh, this is something that Jesus will explain further later on. Uh, that would be in John chapter 15, verse 3. If someone could read out that for us right now. John 15, verse 3. John chapter 15, verse 3. We are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So these disciples who heard the words which Jesus was speaking to them, words which are full of life and the spirit. So the disciples believed in these words. They accepted the words and they began to practice them. They began to obey these words in their daily lives. So the word of God cleansed them. They became clean. So for such people, you don't need an entire bath because they have already been bathed and washed by the word of God. So Jesus says, such people, only you know whatever needs to be cleansed on a day-to-day -day basis, that needs to be taken care of because you're, overall you have already been cleansed. However, not all of you have been cleansed because there is one disciple who has been pretending to hear Jesus' words and follow them. But actually, in no way has he bothered to accept Jesus' words. He has not submitted to Jesus' words. And so here, you know, Jesus says, not all of you are clean. There is you know, one person here who has not actually been cleaned. But the rest of you, you don't need a complete bath because you have already been cleansed by my word. You are already following my word. Uh, so um, we see here that... Jesus, by physically cleansing them, he's con conveying a spiritual message that he is going to cleanse them at a spiritual level where they will be completely washed of all of their sinfulness. The legal indebtedness, you know, which is standing against them legally, it will all be wiped out, cancelled, cleaned, and they will be completely justified in the eyes of God. Where when, when, when God looks at them, he will see them as, as righteous as Jesus is as righteous. You know, So they will have that level of righteousness, the same level of righteousness which Jesus has. So that is the privilege which Jesus is giving to the people who are following him. There's something that we notice over here, you know, um, Jesus in, in verse 8, when, G, when Jesus says, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Look at the contrast between what Jesus says over here and all the other religions of the world. In all the religions of the world, people serve the deity in the hope that by you know serving the deity, the deity will be pleased with them and then the deity will do something for them. And then they will be a part of the deity. They'll have the privilege of being, maybe, you know, uh, of uh, being considered a follower of that deity. So they do the serving. They offer something to the deity. And they are hoping that the deity will be pleased and do something for them. But the living God, he says, what can anyone do for me? I already have everything. I am infinite. You know, I am. He's, you know, he literally calls himself I am. He's completely sufficient in every way. He doesn't lack anything. He is, I am. He is completely sufficient in every way in himself. Doesn't need anything from anyone. So nobody can offer him something and, you know, um, get something from him. He already has everything. He doesn't need any. So in fact, he is willing to do something for us, serve us, so that then we can be a part of him. Do you see the contrast over here? People all over the world are struggling and trying to do things to get God and be a part of him but the living God says you can't do anything for me I already have everything I am the great I am so I am now willing to offer you something through this work of Jesus 
are you willing to humble yourself and accept it so that you can be a part of me that's the only way you can be a part of me you can't bribe me and you know um, um, pay me to become a part of me you have to humble yourself and accept what i am offering that's the only way you can be a part of me is what jesus you know is is saying to his people so um peter uh, jesus doesn't really need peter's service peter needs jesus service because it's only through jesus service that peter can any have any hope of a future okay so that's the amazing thing which the living god is offering us um and um yeah we we go on to see that uh, judas you know misses out on this he does not want a part of this um let's look at verse 12 onwards uh, maybe we can read up to verse 17 Uh, verses 12 to 17 if someone could read out john 13 12 to 17 so when he had washed their feet taken his uh, garments and sat down again he said to them do you know what i have done to you you call me teacher and lord and you say will for so i am if i then you lord your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also ought to wash one another feet for i have given you an example so that you should do as i have done to done to you most assuredly i say to you a servant is not greater than his master nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him if you know those things blessed are you if you do them so jesus says do you understand what i have done for you um and he goes on to say now that i your lord and teacher have washed your feet you also should wash one another's feet and he goes on to say now that you know these things you will be blessed if you do them it's one thing to hear to listen to me saying this but tomorrow onwards i wanted to actually start practicing this you also are supposed to wash one another's feet so is is that all jesus is saying that from the next day onwards the disciples you know should take tubs of water and start washing each other's feet is so much more that is being talked about over here because that physical act of washing the feet is not a big deal especially in our current times i mean when when we when no in our churches when we do the feet washing ceremony it's a good thing that we do we are doing it as a as a reminder to us of what jesus has taught us so yes it is an excellent and good re reminder but when we are doing that ceremony in our churches the people whose feet we are cleaning are quite clean and we in fact we are given gloves and all of that to you know to do the washing so it really doesn't involve any kind of uh, you know effort here Jesus is talking about how we should be serving each other and helping each other. A little bit of that comes out in Galatians chapter six, verses one to two. So I'm just pointing out the fact that it goes beyond the physical act of washing, which is quite easy. The spiritual washing of one another that's going to take a lot of investment in someone's life, and that's much more hard. It involves sacrifice. Let's look at Galatians chapter six, verses one and two, please. Galatians six one and brethren, if a man is overtaken is any transfers, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It says over here. you know when you see another person getting dirty you know they are they're falling into sin they are backsliding restore that person gently don't just ignore you know and don't gossip about them behind their back and say ah see that person is doing that 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 rather than that go to them sit with them pray with them strengthen them restore them gently 
and be careful while you're doing it so that you also don't end up in the same kind of sin you know so you should be influencing them they should not be influencing you so it has to be done very carefully but the point is it says here carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of christ so we are meant to wash one another's feet in the sense we should carry each other's burdens help one another in walking in the lord because it's tough living as a christian as uh, living as a as a god pleasing believer is tough so we need to be there for each other helping each other now let us say that you actually see some person who is caught in sin and you want to restore them you walk up to them and you tell them you know oh, brother what you're doing is really bad you know you need to change your ways you need to repent or otherwise some terrible uh, consequence will come upon you you think the person will listen to you they'll say mind your own business they will not like it when will they listen to you if they know you as a person who has been investing in their life someone who sits with them cares about them and their family who prays with them who has been fellowshipping with them if you are that kind of a person and you go to them and say you know what i'm seeing it's breaking my heart please help me so that you know um, help me to help you so that you know you can come out of this thing they will listen to you because you have invested in their life so this washing of people's feet is not an easy business you first of all need to earn the right to be able to speak into their lives others they'll not listen to you so what jesus is asking us to do over here requires commitment it requires time you know we all have busy lives uh, we only have time for our job and you know to take care of the responsibilities of home so this would mean you have to create extra time for other people it's going to take effort it's going to take sacrifice and then when you go and you say to them you know i want to uh, help you come out of this situation that you're getting into then they will be willing to listen because they know you genuinely care about them and have invested them in their lives in the past so this is a difficult thing which the lord is asking so once a year it's very easy to go to the church and do a feet washing ceremony the people who are coming over they will come with their feet already washed so that you know they'll not have to undergo the humiliation of having dirty feet so it's very very easy to do it as a physical act but we are expected to also fulfill the spiritual implications of this command which is much more difficult which is why jesus says now that you know these things you will be blessed if you do them it's good enough to hear about it but you will be blessed if you do these things which i am telling you to do and that we have we all know from experience is more difficult because you know we have all tried to you know invest in other people and it's a difficult thing it involves sacrifice it involves love and commitment you know where we care about those people that we are trying to help um so yes we'll move on into the other verses um, maybe verse 18 uh, up to verse 21 yeah verses 18 to 21 where now jesus is beginning 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 to talk about the person who will betray him 18 to 21 i'm not referring to all of you i know those i have chosen but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture he who shared my bread has turned against me i am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen you will believe that i am who i am very truly i tell you whoever accepts any one i send accepts me and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me after he had said this jesus was troubled in spirit and testified very truly i tell you one of you is going to betray me so jesus basically says i'm revealing this to you beforehand that someone is going to definitely betray me from among you i'm revealing this to you so that you will believe when it happens that i was always in control i wasn't taken by shock i wasn't surprised i knew this is going to happen i have been in charge of all the events which have been happening up to now nothing is going to shake me and take me by surprise even this ultimate betrayal i already knew it's going to take place and that is why i'm telling you about it even before it happens so that you will not get scared when it happens don't worry everything is under control i am still you know in full control so the lord is trying to assure them that all power has indeed been placed under him is not helpless so actually if god wanted to you know um, not go through with this 
Judas could not have done anything to hurt him. So it, it is Jesus humbling himself and allowing these things to be done to him so that we can be redeemed, so that our illegal indebtedness can be cancelled and so that we can be victorious over the evil forces. So he, did, he was doing it on our behalf. So he assures them that he's telling them beforehand so that they don't have to be upset or scared. He's still in charge. He's still in control. And here we have the response of the disciples. Uh, which is nice. I mean, we can actually look into these verses and get uh, you know some some lessons for ourselves from here. Uh, verses twenty two to uh, twenty eight. Verses twenty two to twenty eight. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then uh, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he who to whom sh I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it and having dipped the bread of gave it to Judas Iscroti, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What do you do? Quickly, do quickly. What no one at the table knew. For what reason he said this to him. So here we see the disciples very puzzled. There are just 12 of them over there, you know, not exactly a large uh, group. Just 12 of them. And Jesus is saying that one of the 12 is going to betray him. So they're all rather confused because they know each other very, very well. They've been living together for three years now. So they're wondering which of them will ever do such a horrible thing. And then, you know, Jesus, uh, it says over here in verse 26, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. You know, later on, we know, I mean, we who of the New Testament times, we know the significance of this. This is basically communion. You know, this is basically us partaking in the blood and body of Jesus. So even in this final hour, Jesus is giving Judas one last chance. He's dipping the bread and giving it to Judas as well. And even now Judas can, you know, change his mind and say, I will not betray uh, Jesus. Even now he can choose to make that decision. But he takes the bread, but his heart is still hard. You know, even though he has accepted the dipped bread from Jesus, he does not change his thinking. So because he does not change his thinking, after he takes the bread, Satan enters into him. And now he's completely under Satan's control. So because that's why later, even when he's so repentant and, you know, he wishes that he had not done this evil thing, he's so much under the control of Satan that he thinks I'm finished. The, say, the Peter felt hope, but Judas did not feel any hope because Satan had controlled his mind to such an extent by then that he ends up going and committing suicide. So it's a very sad thing that we see that even in this last final hour, Judas is given a chance. Jesus literally dips that bread and hands it to him personally. So that even now, if he wants to, he can change his mind. But Judas in his greed for money, you know, decides not to, um, you know, do it. So then, so then Jesus says, whatever you're about to do, do it quickly. Because anyway, the, now, the hour has come, no need to delay any longer. The hour has come for the sun to be glorified. So he says, do it quickly. Uh, but the people over there don't understand what exactly he's supposed to be doing quickly. They don't realize that it's Judas who is going to be betraying. Um, so here, we see the contrast between uh, Judas and the other disciples. The other disciples heard the words of Jesus, uh, obeyed his words, and were cleaned, cleansed by his word. On the other hand, Judas heard the same words, but he did not respond to those words. He did not submit to them. And so he remained unclean, uncleansed. And that one last opportunity which was given to him to change, he refused to accept it. And uh, so he makes an outward show of taking the bread, but inwardly 
he is still against the person with whom he is fellowshipping over bread you know the taking of bread was like very meaningful when people fellowship over bread they are saying we are united we are with one another uh, we will not conspire against each other so outwardly judas pretends to be with jesus but inwardly he has not changed his heart and therefore satan enters into him and takes full control of his mind and his will okay so uh, we see that terrible result um let us look at uh, matthew 10 verses 1 to 4 I'm only bringing up these verses to kind of, you know, uh, conclude this whole thought on uh, Judas. So Matthew 10, verses 1 to 4. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Yeah, yeah. For due to lack of time, maybe, you know, that, that one verse should be enough, uh, where Jesus is giving authority to all the 12 disciples so even judas is included in this bunch even judas is given authority to drive out impure spirits so a person who was given that kind of authority is now allowing himself to be captured by by, by those impure spirits what is tragedy i mean he was among the chosen few of that time given that authority to be able to drive out evil spirits but he allows himself to be defeated to be controlled and defeated by those evil spirits so that's the sad thing that we see and that is why matthew 27 verses 22 to 23 this is what jesus says over there in matthew 27 22 to 23 jesus says many will say to me on that day lord lord did we not prophesy in your name and in your, in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles then i will tell them plainly I never knew you away from me, evil doers. So Judas was given a chance to know Jesus personally and develop a relationship with him. But Judas rejected that. And Jesus said to him, I never knew you. So it will not matter how many miracles we can perform. It will matter whether we know him in that personal relationship sense, where we have responded to his words. And we have begun to actually accept them in simple faith and start believing them and obeying them and practicing them on a daily basis. If we have been doing that, then yes, he knows us because now we are his disciples, his true followers. And he will extend all his authority and power to aid us and help us in our warfare against the evil powers. He will because he's for us. He has done all this, you know, for our benefit. Uh, so um rather than being like judas we need to be like the uh you know the um the other 11 disciples now just coming to this little portion about you know the uh, it talks about how uh, you know the the disciple who was resting on jesus bosom and it sounds rather weird i mean you know grown up man going and laying his uh, face on the bosom of another man makes no sense it's just basically the seating that was done in those days because you know they would basically have this table which is almost at floor level and so they would sit around this table uh, which is like a floor table it's not like our table which has you know which is standing on four legs so it's almost at the floor level and all these people are sitting around that table uh, using cushions to support them so basically they would be sitting with their body and hands facing towards the table so that they can eat but their feet are pointing away from the table can you picture that in your minds so they're leaning towards the table so that they can take the food and eat it but their feet are pointing away from the table that is how they arrange themselves around the table so basically you know if i'm uh, sitting along with another person over here my head is kind of you know very close to her shoulder and her bosom. So that's the kind of seating arrangement that is being talked about over here. So which is why John is ha happens to be sitting next to Jesus and his face is like almost leaning on Jesus' shoulder because all their feet are away and their bodies are towards the table. So picture that in your mind. That will make it easier for you to understand. So here, there's a contrast being made between the disciple, you know, the writer of this gospel, 
who was in that close relationship with Jesus. And then you, uh, in contrast, you have Judas, who is so far away from Jesus. One is a man who has made a commitment to trust this Jesus and even you know stand at the foot of the cross along with him. On the other hand, you have this other disciple who was so far away from Jesus. No, so um, let us be like John the writer and the other 11 disciples rather than being like Judas. Uh, so we'll continue this chapter. Uh, only a little bit is left. Uh, so we will continue this chapter next week and also cover uh, you know, chapter 14 and maybe even 15. Let's see. Okay, so let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for the things that you have taught us today from these two chapters. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, uh, that we would be people who believe in you and uh, so we will not have hardened hearts but we will have soft receiving hearts which uh, believe the amazing truths which you talk about in your scripture at a human level it may look like what you're saying is is um, too big to be true but lord let us be like people with soft hearts who will believe even though it seems impossible to believe these amazing things. And we pray that we will see victory in our lives. And we will see the fruit of what Jesus accomplished on the cross when he glorified himself over there. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we will have a love and loyalty towards you, unlike Judas who felt no love or loyalty towards you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.